Hello, hello, hello. This next young man is brilliant. He's like the prodigal son. He disappeared from our orbit for a while, but he's back. And it thrills me no end. Discovered him a few years ago. He has two books out that are remarkable. Written in Vain, that's V-E-I-N, Written in Vain. And the other is Ashtray Highway. Heaven? Heaven? See, I'm having a senior moment. Ashtray Heaven. Well, the content I remember, and it's wonderful. So here he is without further ado, Jared Levine. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good to be here, good to be back. Ashtray Highway is not a bad title, though, I gotta say. <laughs> I'll be reading uh, a bunch of new poems tonight, some of which I've tried out before, but most of which I don't believe anyone has heard. And they will be uh, in my next collection called On Your Knees, due to come out sometime in the future. Blessed are those who find small joys large, who collect the detritus of imperfect lives and ascribe new purpose to the discarded. Blessed are those who refuse to be doomed, whose hearts are too full for pity, but thrive on strength, mercy, and kindness. Blessed are the givers and gracious receivers of love. End of part one. The self-help author implores don't let it get to you, it being the character you ascribe the world, its nature, the patterns you have noticed often enough to define as innate and unchangeable. Listen to me if you are tired of it, if it has already gotten to you and you must get out from under it. I am here to save you. I know a secret, and because you bought the book, I will share. It is not what you think it is. It is not beyond your control. It is not an unstoppable force or an immovable object. It is very stoppable, very movable, and I want to tell you how to stop it and move it and regain control of your life. And you listen. It is an audiobook a coworker purchased as a secret Santa gift. A generic present, perhaps, but more thoughtful than a gift card. You wonder briefly if the co-worker followed this author's advice, if they stopped, moved, and took control of their life, became free of it. The narrator goes on. It is not something the world has imposed on you, not some code or algorithm implanted in your brain by the U.S. government. It is not a conspiracy just because everybody whispers about it, but no one seems to know entirely what it is or how it functions. No, friend, it is not an alien that has taken control of your body. It is not subliminal messaging, not the result of drinking tainted water or watching too much television. It has nothing to do with the rules and regulations of the thousands of cities, townships, and municipalities across America, nor is it imported from the old countries of Europe it is not a remnant of monarchy and feudalism, despite the obvious contingencies that become apparent upon close examination. But you've been examining too closely, friend, trying to pin down precisely what it is. And just as the letters of a word dissolve when repeated, and the meaning of a word disappears when stared at, so too do your efforts to understand it lead you only further from the truth. Who knew you could purchase truth for $12.99? A good bargain, all things considered. And you've considered them all, friend, haven't you? Are you ready? Do you want to know what it is? The interaction between amorality and karma in the wilds of these strange times if you are expecting some grand reveal, some curtain drawn dramatically upwards, some unveiling ceremony for the sake of good old-fashioned closure, you will have suffocated 
by the time this sentence with a formal grammatical period ends. That's all life gives. Punctuation marks, little dots and dashes, Morse code, mouse turds, pellets of rat poison, table scraps or grains of salt, sand, beads of sweat, sweetness, yeses in small doses. If you are searching for the source of joy, the cure for pain, the truth will hurt like buckets of rain dumped 90 degrees vertical. Because the truth is not the rain or the sting, but the dry awning three feet to your blind side. If you are expecting the world to just roll over and let you rub its belly, you brought home the wrong stray from the shelter. If no one has shown you by now the difference between books and covers, or theft and survival, justice and malice, or whatever, if your whole experience has taught you to expect whatever, react whatever, covet and praise whatever, it's all right. You can get by without being righteous, without even being right, and still, somehow, not be wrong. If you are planning to live this way, entranced by the success of your own idiocy, I say, whatever. That dog will bite when your hand runs out of food. Omnipresence. There is a poem somewhere in this morning, somewhere in the fog unfurling, revealing inch by rising curtain inch, a sky so cerulean it could belong to any season. There is a poem somewhere just beyond vision, somewhere yet unformed, shapeless, and lawless. There were poems written in my sleep, poems thrown out in my wake, undead and unceremoniously left unburied, stillborn poems returned to ash. Poems of sunrise and vespertine shadow, Poems gargled and drowned in quick typhoons. Poems liquefied. Poems found in puddles, settled at ocean's base, like the legend of captain's treasure. There is a poem back of the smoke in my eye, in the aqueous shield of a tear that won't fall. A poem I cannot see, but know its feel. There are many poems I am too stubborn to write. Poems become other, poems made ephemera, poems I have slaughtered, concealed like evidence, poems of crime scenes once full of promise, poems the cops will never find. There are poems I have forgotten, willfully deleted like sinful memories, and poems of unconfessed truths. Poems damned, left to burn among the licking flames eternal, erstwhile poems of good luck and liberty, poems once full of love. So many poems with fates unknown, unwritten and unread, these are the best poems of my life. These are the masterpieces of today, hanged by the neck in dewy morning backdrop. These are poems of potential, unhinged from the fragile latticework of human tongues, poems wholly unutterable, inimitable, poems nothing at all like their replacements, these impostors constructed in their honor. There is a poem somewhere near, I sense it. It is a poem indifferent of being a poem, an unpoem. Not a poem, in fact, but poetry. There is poetry somewhere, and everywhere is somewhere. Open mic. These are rooms that used to fill with smoke, 
rooms in which the people up front could not see the people in back, wondered if in fact there were people in front or back, or just a hundred lit untended cigarettes, like little dazzling blisters popping in the grayscale. Rooms whose dimensions could not be discerned, became more obscured for the squint. Rooms draped in wraith-like contrast, saturated blanket thick with carbon, unbreathable rooms where applause cleared the air and its echoes clung to the artist's clothes. These are rooms where truth was unshackled, rooms from whose emotions you could not hide, could not find a corner to cry in, even if you thought you could see it, even if you thought the doors were open, part of you would never leave. The Dancer, for Billy Collins. So you have come to dance with the angels on a crowded pinhead, on a cushion plotted seam to seam with pins, on a sewing table strewn with cushions. Because the seamstress plays music through those long winter nights, ballads that cool the parquet floor like mint in ice cream, blues that match your favorite faded jeans and the kind of sky you used to think would lead to love. And now you have returned to think wishfully, to revisit her radio and try for a dance, despite your duplicate left feet, your lead-legged jive and dead-dimmed eyes, so unlike your light-filled angel, but ask, ask her to waltz or twist or shake whichever dance angels on pinheads dance. For even the seamstress pities you among her clothes and her million other pins. She picks you out singly to teach the history of popular music, to hone your footwork and stitch up your nerve. She lets you practice in privacy, darkness, leaves the volume on low when she turns in for sleep, and you listen until you feel safe, until you no longer hear but feel each note, until you are so moved that you've moved and keep moving, keep dancing, until you return to that pin and show the whole of heaven what you've got. <clears throat> COVID. <clears throat> we the beautiful people. That burly, hairy man in the Paul Bunyan flannel shirt, with his clover red mustache flowing like cable knit twill down the front of his Hollywood square jawline. Yes, even that muscle-bound, hulking, heartthrob hunk can be seen deep-throating his toothbrush, gagging into the mirror as he scrapes the thrush from his tongue and drools over the bathroom sink. Everyone poops, and it always smells, but smells dissipate. That supermodel babe in the 200K supercharged turbo twin cam sports car with makeup like James Bond's flavor of the week, her too tight bikini and suspiciously curvaceous gluteus maximus stuffed in the driver's seat, snug as the silicon molds that sit beneath her breasts. Even that girl can be burst in upon just as the fart she's been suppressing for three days mouses forth from that same groove thing she was shaking less than an hour ago and squeaks up the whole room. So easy to laugh at others for being so much like ourselves, as if we're surprised or excited or disgusted or confused or relieved or any number of alternative adjectives to see how the shoe looks on the other foot, to confirm the other foot indeed wears a shoe and isn't always pedicured may in fact have bunions, and to wonder then what other all-too-familiar flaws might befall those people we have decided 
are beautiful. Assumed to have bleached buttholes and mint-fresh breath and skin that sweats rose water. People whom we suppose pay other people to brush their teeth and scrub their asses. But how refreshing to think of them now as equals, as grotesque and human, and yes, as beautiful. For it is the basest things that level the playing field, that bring us up or cut us down, that put us in our place together. <clears throat> Was your mother, tell me something, what was your mother like before she had you? Are there pictures from prom night of lavish satin gowns and sparkling tiaras? Is there a dapper young man on her arm? Is he your father? Did your mom break high school curfew, go to college mixers? Did she toss back vodka and debride her wrist of salt before tequila? Did she smoke menthol or regulars? Were there lots of boys with names ending in Y or IE? Were there Dannys and Bobbies and Billies and Robbies, Joeys and Jimmies and Davies and Timmies, a Tommy or two, a Barry and Larry, Dicky and Ricky? When did she meet Daddy? Was Grandma worried sick? Was she always asking, why don't you find a nice Christian boy, a nice whatever boy from a good family? Did grandpa threaten to cut her off or kick her out? Was your mom on the pill? Do you think she was worried about hep C or AIDS or even the clap? I mean, really worried? Did she teach you from a young age that women are just as, if not more, capable than men at any particular task, but our culture is inherently imbalanced to favor those already in power? Did she tell you to treat everyone with the same level of respect, but to watch how very few other people would do the same? Did you learn as a child about sexism, gender bias, double standards, personal empowerment? Did you grow up a feminist? Or was your father the sort of man who avoided that sort of conversation? Wasn't that ironic? Tell me something. Did you ever ask your mother what she was like before she had you? And what happened? TGIF, it's a haiku. Apropos, Friday the 13th. Thank God it's Friday, is what I was taught to say. Bless the mercy kill. Ubermensch. One. Where is my hero and his gallant stretch limo? Where is his matte chrome American Express card? his platinum-plated cash clip and boomerang money so gracefully thrown around? Where is my icon's thundering Learjet, the one designed to run on charisma? Where can I purchase a replica of his famed bulletproof ego? Where is his diamond-polished mirror of inconceivable flattery? and the soothsayer inside who guides seekers to ceaseless wealth and power and unimpeachable tax write-offs, tell me, where did my hero learn the art of mastery? Who showed him the proper way to dominate those beneath him, subjugate his debtors? How many lips have flattered his marquee cut pinky finger pimp's ring, or been made to brush against the well-fed, bleached blonde flesh of his butt cheek. My hero, with his Teflon shield of self-importance, his personal, patented brand of narcissism, moves among us, yet remains untouched. 
What priceless radioactive element does he bathe in? What unholy ambrosia does he substitute for coffee? What molten lava lubricant allows him to flow from triumph to triumph? Tell me. I too want my hero's parade, name on a tall building in gold leaf lettering, glittering like magnifying glass above a sidewalk littered with penniless ants. I too want to toss pennies from the penthouse and claim they fell from heaven. Two. For you are the slick one, Mont Blanc pen wielding corporate executive prototype clad in custom Italian suits, shoes shined by the tongues of your slavering minions. Your competitors cowed into submission, your hair combed over with the oleaginous homage paid by your cabal of televised sycophants. You are the steel eyed deal maker the iron fist with the golden touch, a machine much too busy to bother with updates. You have no time for these polysyllabic adjectives, these pleas for change, pleases and thank yous of the politesse, these people who deny your greatness. For you are the builder of fortunes, surveyor of markets, for you, says the apprentice from the anteroom desk, it's all for you. Always for you, they call. They heed your every beck and biscuit of fiscal advice. For you are the one who knows. You are the one who dictates, who lactates solvency. You, with your armory of Rolex and Breitling, your smithery of platinum tie bars, titanium golf clubs, and club memberships, for you, I bring this contract. Offer this piece of meat for your personal butchery. For you are the judge and executioner, the long, strong arm of the law and outstretched hand of the Lord, I beseech you, O hero, accept this blank check and let me bask in the glow of your exclusive copyright. Three. Let's get down to business. I come for the gold, the Spanish rubies, and blood-stained Kinshasa diamonds. Give up the vault code. Give me the combo. I want your condo in Costa del Sol, the Amalfi Villa in Costa Rica Hacienda. I need the Tudor Castle and the floating party yacht anchored in international waters. It's high time a new hero mounted a million dollar filly and blasted off to the races. You knew this day would come. You said as much yourself to the one you usurped, that such power only transfers in a guillotine swift coup. Did you look in your rival's eyes and snarl there's a new sheriff in town? Sorry, babe, it's just business, nothing personal. It didn't have to end like this. But of course it did and always does. My hero doesn't ride off into sunsets, beach sand footprints receding with the evening tide. He limps, bedraggled into poverty, anonymous, ragged and ashamed, less concerned with his current state than the graceless fall he took to reach it. How stunned he seems to have arrived here, where pennies litter the sidewalk, and no one cares where they came from. On your knees. Means you submit to no matter what, whatever demands it, whatever compels you, forces you down, whatever force holds you, hangs you up, Whatever promises of strength it makes, 
provided it doesn't kill you, though whatever it is won't make that promise. It means you are pleading, begging for it. it means you are desperate, no longer secret. What leaves you exposed, naked, and open it means you are vacant, exhausted, damaged, means you have demurred, lied, and lain down, means you are gone, web-wrapped, spiraled, means you are spinning, trying not to spin, trying to make it stop, or trying to start again, means you are seeking something, answers, truth, change, means you are locked in, doesn't mean you like it means you are grateful for mercy and grace, means you are meta, self-referential, makes you sentient, sensitive to extremely low frequencies, fuzz electricity, growth of cells and birth of batteries, means you acknowledge the billion collisions occurring within the universe, within your body, within the universe of timeless, spaceless universes, means you have survived every one of those collisions, means you are unaccountably fortunate, but mean to enjoy the fortune while it lasts. For you have hungered long in the shadows, and your hunger has lingered, lapsed into anger, means you are growling, groveling tableside for scraps, scrabbling at the butcher's blood-soaked floorboards, lapping at dry stains between planks. Means your competition sniffs death on dawn's frost, that you sense them sensing your weakness. Means you are dire, done weeping, for weeping does nothing to keep you breathing. Weeping only drains the cloud of rain, and you need a storm means you must summon the rage of thunder, the throbbing drum of a darkling nimbus, must make its rumble your only cry, a cry of war, a call to arms, means you must rise up to make a stand, means you have waited till deadline's edge, the 11th hour, 59th minute, means the second hand ticks like a hammer cocked colt, the pressure of galloping horse, headache the size of a Clydesdale, means the moment is nigh, now or never, no more second chances, means this is the do-over, mulligans spent and no return, means that point came at the start, this is borrowed time on bad credit with exorbitant interest and penalties, means you cannot repay a miracle but God, do you pray? Oh God, make it stop. God, help me start. Give me a break that won't leave me broken. Means you are shameless, must have it. Means you are here for it, ready and willing, on your knees, hailing Mary like a virgin taxi, a bright solar flare of salvation, a sign shining through the haze of sin like sun piercing the firmament's veil a crystalline arrow to point the way, means you are the lost love of the light, the damned seeking solace in a shortened sentence, means you have been a fool so long, but it's so hard to change, means you have been patient long enough, and you are now the one who defines how long enough is, means you are ready to resume the helm, to speak and be heard, to spark and have heart. O oh, captain, dear captain, O oh, courage and spirit, with your ship half sunk, the rats drunk on your rum, with inches of salt caked on your lips, still you whispered. With your vision stabbed blind by midday sun, still you strained, still you tried to guide the crew home means the dead who loved you loved not in vain, means the soul they saw was no mirage, you deserved their trust, 
for you gave what was given means even the bravest of men break down, but only the doomed stay broken. Means you don't need to know what tomorrow brings. Means be ready today. Means destiny is now. Earn it. Take it. Means that's bullshit. Means nothing at all. And that's what you'll become if you keep behaving like an animal, thirsty, greedy for water, means you are losing control of that smug inner monologue, that sweet little mockingbird who cooed so many sweet little lies in your over-eager ear. This is not a mistake. However you got here, you got here yourself, means you lost, and there was nothing to win, no one to impress with your tears and skilled pleading, no judge to praise nicer than ever on your knees. Please absolve me, I'll do anything you want. Suck dick and eat cunt upside down, right side up, whatever you ask for or take. Any version of rape you can nightmare, just do it. Get it over with. And no one, till now, to tell you stop. Get over yourself, get up. Stand up, own up, grow up, suck it up and spit it out, move on. I mean it. Bury the darkness before it becomes a comfort since it's already a blanket. And you're one bead of sweat away from total desiccation. One faint desert heartbeat from becoming vultures dinner. Means life is just a poem on papyrus finger painted with saliva, yet you've spent it in search of gifts no one could give. Means what you desire can only be desired, not had, not held, not taken. And now your desires have outgrown even your imagination's reach. Means you lack the tools, the language, that silver tongue now pitted, silent. Listen, you cannot question what you cannot ask for, you cannot tell what you cannot speak, you cannot see your eyes, seeing eyes that seem like your eyes looking out, means you must look within, means I cannot do it for you, means let go, there is no starting over, only going forward. Only now and forever. Amen. This last one is called Footnote. This is being a writer, scribbling a few lines in a book full of scribbled lines to be placed on a shelf full of books full of scribbled lines, knowing that no one is likely ever to read them any of them. It has nothing to do with plot, character, publishing, agents, press releases, social media, fans, autographs, public readings, Mark Twain, Ernest Hemingway, Jane Austen, James Baldwin, Ezra Pound, Sylvia Plath, David Foster Wallace, Joyce Carol Oates, or whomever, or when or wherever, or whatever fire your college professor lit under your idealistic adolescent behind. Whatever inspiration you took from someone else's poetry or novel, your favorite French film, or the perfect jazz record, nothing to do with exposed brick lofts in Brooklyn, or sun-baked Spanish haciendas, hobo-centric road trips, or week-long wine and weed-infused spitball sessions. It is lonely, self-absorbed, tedious, and secretive. It is about you, your work, your dedication to your craft. It does not exist until you create it. It is your time, your life, every bloody inch of it. That's all. Thank you very much.